Thanks, everyone. Really excited to be here today. I tell you, already this morning, uh, I feel like I'll just spend the next bit of time just smiling at you. Because what a great time to be together with God's people. And you know, uh, my wife and I, a few years ago, Pastor Charlie was so helpful for us in this. We uh, pioneered a four-square church, so we started up, gosh, it was right before COVID. That was not that great of planning, right? But we started that church up, and um, so now since the end of 2019, the pastor of the church came across Four-Square Church, and just a few months ago, we got to merge with another Four-Square Church, an older Four-Square Church out by Valley Shields Hospital in Madera, and they had a church building, so we had just been meeting in schools. And now we came together, praised God, two different families and churches, and now we're together in these last few months in this church. And you know what? Last week, as I was leading worship, all the electricity went out. <laughs> so I think it might be me. Maybe I can get it out. But I want to tell you, I am not planning to say anything about that, obviously. But you know why I'm so full of joy? Because when that happened to us last, last week, and now as this group of God's people together, thank God that we don't let something like just the professional thing stop our hearts from worshiping God. Amen? What an incredible lesson that is. Worship has nothing to do with how it sounds and the origin. It has everything to do with our hearts. And boy, it just, it hit me. I'll tell you, I had a discussion with a young man once, and he was talking about, um, uh, he was telling me all the great times of worship he had had. And he talked about times at camps, or maybe one of the mission trips from big stadiums. And he said, but you know, God really challenged me. And he said, what, what does God think is a great time of worship? What would our Lord say is a great time of worship? And you know, I'm convinced what it was is something like electricity goes out, and all of God's people don't care, and they still want to love their Lord Jesus, and they sing, they came along with our Lord. Right? It's awesome. That's the heart of worship. So, I mean, I have a hard time getting over that. I just want to create it for the next all the while. Praise God. What a joyful thing that is. It also hit me, you know, as God's people, we talk about all the reasons we come together in church. It can kind of get pretty basic when we really get down to it. We're here to open the Word of God and learn about the Lord. We're here to corporately come together and worship Him. And then we're here to get to know one another and lift each other up. Those are really the basic things. And it hit me this morning, too. You know which one of those is eternal? I'm not going to hear a sermon when I'm in heaven, as funny as that sounds. I'm not going to be on a mission trip in heaven. We're going to be in great communion with each other, but we are going to worship our Lord God eternally. So thank you. Thank you. Even before I get going this morning, thank you for participating in the eternal and having the real heart of that. That was a real blessing to me this morning. So I've gotten to come and speak with you a few times. As I said, I so appreciate the friendship of your pastor, Charlie. He's just such a precious man and a good friend to me over these years. And I look back on the last time. I've been able to come and be with you, I think, two times in 2017, 18, 19, around then, 20 maybe. So it's been a while. But as I come, every time I ask Pastor Charlie, okay, what are you talking about? What's being taught? What is the Lord dealing with in, the, in this group of people right now? And then I always pray, Lord, is there some way that I can help to supplement that? I'm certainly not going to jump into the series, but is there something, Lord, that you would give me to help kind of come alongside and, and just be a, a blessing, a supplement? He told me you're talking about living in the last days. And oh, Lord God, is that huge for us, isn't it? What an intense time in our culture right now. You look out at the culture and the politics and even the physical world shaking up everything it's an intense time so thank god that he speaks to us from his word we don't have to be worried or shaky about how do we navigate it because god speaks to us so i was excited to see that's what's been going on and it's interesting because when i do think also of end times and we read in scriptures about what's going to be happening i don't know if you're like this but i kind of I kind of get the concept of me kind of being inside, kind of looking out. As part of God's people, and I've walked the Lord a long time, I had the benefit of being raised in a Christian home, and so my parents 
brought me to know the things of the Lord, and I gave my life to Jesus as a young boy. So it's been a long time. So many of you also feel like, okay, I know these things of the Lord. I don't feel like I'm in danger all of a sudden of falling into these end-time heresies and things like that. It almost feels like I'm kind of inside looking at that. But then it hit me, well, but I've still seen believers fall away. I still have struggles myself also, even as, it sounds funny to say it this way, even as like an insider, there's still massive challenges in these last days. And the Lord brought to mind a section of scripture where Jesus was talking to his followers. So we'll get to look at today what he's talking to you and I, already followers of Jesus, but talking to us about the challenges that we're facing in our spiritual lives in the last days. So not so much that stuff that's out there that we see with the world, but the stuff that me and you, as a follower of Christ, but you know, there's still some challenges for me. So we're going to look at this scripture today. It's in the chapter of 9 of Luke. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 9. I love whenever we get to tell the stories of Jesus and look at the Gospels. Uh, let me remind you, it's not four different accounts. All the four Gospels, it's an amazing thing. It's, it's as if there were four people out on the corner of the intersection, and they all saw an accident happen. So you got someone at each of the four corners writing down what happened and, and telling it. And then they might be word for word, but then sometimes one of the accounts sees something a little bit that someone else didn't see, or they give a few other details. That is what the four Gospels show us, the story of Jesus. So it's amazing. I just love when you get to read in a Gospel, and then maybe one of the other writers wrote the exact thing. It reminds me of the story of when Jesus crossed uh, the water in the storm, and three of the writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all told the same story. But Mark remembered Jesus laid his head on a pillow. I, I don't know anything about the fact, except that that gives us a very well-rounded story. We can trust that we have a wonderful story of all of God's work, all of Jesus' life and ministry. We get a very fleshed-out example of this. So this account in Luke chapter 9, we also see in Matthew. But I want to read from Luke 9. It's going to be from verses 57 to 62. And it's Jesus talking to his, some followers. But it's going to challenge you and I about things that we face in these days. And perhaps as kind of an insider, things that might be difficult for me in my following after Jesus. So Luke 9, 57 to 62 says, As they were walking along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to them, Foxes have dens and the birds in the sky have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus said to another, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. And as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. Now I hear those words from Jesus, and the first thing I think is, whoa, aren't, aren't we supposed to be getting followers? Isn't Jesus trying to talk people into following him and showing them who he is? This is an intense account. These three instances of people that are interacting with Jesus, boy, that's some hard, hard stuff. But you know, I love that God isn't ever trying to trick people, right? There's no false advertising, like, oh, hey, come follow me, everything will be great. Ha, <laughs> just kidding, it's kind of hard. We don't see that in scripture. There's no bait and switch. In fact, this kind of reminded me, if you recall, some years ago, I don't know if it's on TV anymore, but for a while it was big, the America's Funniest Videos. Remember you, we watched those on the evenings, and, and still we see it, I think, on YouTube and, and different um, things like that, where you'll see clips of people I can think of two things right off my head. One is, you would see some clips of people trying to cut or trim their trees. And they would set up one ladder, and then another, and then another, and they would be up on top of this rickety old three ladders connected, or maybe a ladder on top of a table. 
And as soon as they started showing those videos, I knew it was going to happen. You know they're going to fall down. You know it's going to be a horrible accident because how silly they would do that. Or the times when you have the, the dads trying to teach the kids how to play baseball, and they're standing there, and you know that that kid is going to hit the ball right to the dad. And he's just going to double over in pain. Oh, you know what's coming. You can tell. You can see it set up. And in a way, this scripture and these three guys talking to Jesus that we're going to look at is that similar setup. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he's not trying to trick people. In fact, you can, he can see what's coming. Another way to look at this section of scripture is almost as if Jesus himself is telling you and I, okay, here's what's going to make you quit following me. I just want to tell you. So you'll be very clear and sober about it. Now, uh, I'm not, well, it's going to be a little silly, but you can tell probably that I'm not one. I'm not a big marathon runner. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been out there recently in those 10 days or those 23 miles. But I do know this. When people go to run those long races, they discuss with them what it's going to be like. And they'll say, okay, around mile nine, you're going to have to go up this big hill. And then around mile 13, you're going to feel really exhausted. You're going to hit the wall. And that's what will happen. And then if you can just make it through that one part, you'll get your second win. Right? They talk through what's going to be the case. I started some jobs in my life where they sat me down and said, okay, <laughs> it's going to feel like a lot of information. You might feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose for a while. And it's going to take you about three months to get this system down. And then actually it'll take you about half a year to get to know how to do this. So that's just what's coming. Well, here our Lord, in talking to those who follow him, is kind of laying that out for us. And you know what's important about that? It's so that you and I, as followers of Christ, aren't surprised when I have these challenges. And we don't let these things take us out of our following after Jesus. The things even on the inside in these last days, as a Christ follower, that would make me stop, I, I already get to see what they are. So let's look at these issues and look at the three men as they come and they talk to Jesus. So it sounds so intense. It's amazing. So in verse 57, they're walking along the road and someone says to him, I will follow you wherever you go. So we have someone that's coming to Jesus that by all accounts there is full of energy, is very, uh, uh, God so committed in my world, I would say they're really fired up. I will follow you, Jesus, wherever you'll go. But look at the response. Jesus says, The foxes have dens and birds in the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus is not trying to cut out on anyone's passion. He's being very realistic and identifying something that's important as we follow Jesus, you know? There's nothing more common than starting out good and just fading away. That's the thing. And what Jesus brings up to try to get someone to take a look at this is this person says, yeah, Jesus, I'm excited. I'll follow you. And Jesus says, well, where I'm going, there might not be any creature comforts. Yeah. And you're not going to be able to get it all dialed in like, oh, this is, I'm all taken care of and this is all set up. And Jesus is talking to this person really about the direction in their life. And you know, you and I as humans, we're just so, um, I'll use my words carefully, we're very self-focused. I'm not saying you're selfish, but really as, as a human, we think of ourselves and take care of ourselves, and this is our thoughts. We're always trying to be okay. But in our life with God, we don't have the... Um, option of saying, okay, well, this is how it's going to be. This is what I want my life to look like. This is about the job I want with this amount of money. This is kind of where I want to live. This is why I, I want to set it all up. And then I'll add in Jesus. And boy, as this excited, fiery, energetic follower seems to just be all on board, Jesus gives a very clear very clear thing right away. Okay, but you're not in charge of where you're going or how your life is. So 
Boy, that, that'll stop us right up, won't it? And you know, something about these issues, I mentioned it's kind of for us that have been following Jesus in this time. Uh, we tend to deal with these same issues over and over and over in our life. And the issue of direction or Jesus leading and me following, it's, it's going to be something we continue to wrestle with. The guy says to Jesus, wherever, I'll follow you wherever. And I'm telling you, what if in your or my life, that whatever is not my plan? Right? And if you've walked with Jesus at all for any amount of time, you've probably already faced that. Well, God, here's what I thought my life would look like. Here's what I want it to look like. If I can get into the right neighborhood, the right job, the right people, and I need to, I need to make that happen. You know, and you tell your stories, think about what I went through. No, 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 I need to make this happen. Well, here's the sobering thing. Who's really in charge of the direction of our life? And it's Jesus. And the thing that hits me, and I want to share with you this, is it's we can trust God. He knows us. He created us. And in his amazing, masterful plan, he is weaving this incredible thing of your story. But I don't think the number one priority in his mind for you is your creature comforts. <clears throat> Amen. That's where God and I get a different view sometimes. <laughs> That's not the number one he thinks. Like, okay, I want my servant, the one that I'm going to have share my life with this broken world, the one that's going to be a carrier for all things of the Spirit of God, that's a living example of the kingdom of God in this darkness. It's my plan to use this person of mine and, well, i got to make sure that they're healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's just such a different different way that God directs. And when he says this, it seems so harsh, but I'll tell you, I love this because it's really blunt. It should be no nothing that cuts, whoa, you mean God isn't after my having the easiest life ever? How, how come? I thought God loves me. He does. And he will absolutely fulfill our lives. John 10.10 10 says that Jesus came to have life. Give us life and life to the fullest or most abundantly. And Ephesians 2.10 says that our lives are like the workmanship of God that he's created for good works for us to do. So he knows how to work that for you and I. And to be honest, if I was calling the shots in the direction and trying to go a certain way, uh, too much of my own desires and taking care of myself would be the primary thing. I saw a cartoon once, and it encapsulates, I think, what Jesus is saying to this guy. It was a cartoon that showed two people driving, and the one in the passenger seat was supposed to be Jesus. And the one driving said, okay, Jesus, you stay over there. I got it. <laughs> and I want to express to you, Jesus tells this follower who's so excited and has such good passion to really be honest here with this idea, who's driving your life? Who's calling the shots? So that's a, that's a huge control issue for me. The direction of my life, I find myself constantly pulling back from God. And I don't want him maybe to have my life go a certain way. Yes, I love God and want to serve him, but can I just do it this way? It can't be right. You know, I'll serve you, God, with this amount of money, <laughs> with this amount of security, with this amount of everything the way I've wanted it. And that's not how it ends up being. I see this in big ways in our lives. Obviously, sometimes this is when we're maybe at the start of our journeys. You know, you're you're thinking about where you're going to go into your career and what you're going to choose to do. Maybe you're thinking about. Um, uh, somebody you're going to spend your life with, you're trying to think about where you want to live, you've got these huge life decisions. Yeah. So at that point in life, obviously, as long as someone following Jesus, what if God starts to show you this is the way I want you to go? But I don't want to do that. We wrestle. But I tell you, for all of us that have gone past those decision points in our life, even the littlest stuff, how many times have things come up where You've got some funds and you're you're thinking your mind for a certain thing, oh, I'm going to go on vacation, and then out of the blue, God, well, there's something else. God, I don't want to stay here and help with the VBS. 
I want to be at Avila on my vacation. <laughs> and you see that we're not saying that God is going to drive your life where there's never anything that fulfills you or that ministers to your soul. No, God loves us. He knows how to do that. But we've got to remain open to say, God, this is what I thought was the direction. And as you speak to me by your spirit, I want to obey you. Even if I don't get it all the time, and even if it's hard on me. So we say, Lord, I'll do that. Um, boy, was I unhappy with my spouse when the time that we had wanted to save some money and it was because I wanted to get a new uh, computer to play some games on. And that's not a bad thing. It was fine. It wasn't like we weren't meeting our other obligations. God does not hate computers. But then we were with a group of God's people and there was a need that came up. And she felt the Holy Spirit measure and she talked to me. I think we need to use that with those funds. And just that little, it's a little snapshot. It happens everywhere, though. It happens everywhere. God, are you really driving my life or am I trying to call the shots? So with this gentleman, our first guy there, that's a pretty big thing. The, the control issue about direction. We constantly deal with that. And the reason I bring it up for us as followers of Jesus is because I've seen when it gets too much in our lives, and that's when people step out of their relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Like, God, I want to go this way. And so that's a challenge for you and I. Now look at the second interaction. Jesus said to another one, so now Jesus approaches this one, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me first go, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go we'll proclaim the kingdom of God. Boy, that one seems really harsh. Right? What in the world? What kind of Jesus is this? Until you look at this and you try to study through it, I found out that in the Middle Eastern culture, oh, I must go and bury my father. It was like an excuse. It was a very common thing to say. Because actually in that time and place, when someone passed away, they were buried within like two, three hours. So this had come into the culture as a way to say, oh, that, you know, I just don't feel ready. And so this was kind of an accepted excuse. So what is that in our world today? Like, oh, I have homework. Or, you know, when someone says, hey, come to do this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I got things to do. It's kind of funny. Back in the 1950s or 60s, I found this out that one of the excuses, oh, I have to wash my hair. <laughs> so if somebody, you know, this young lady, would you come and do this? Oh, I can't. I have to wash my hair. And then, just an excuse. But what's at the heart of these excuses? And what's at the heart of Jesus calling this person to follow him like he calls you and I to follow him? And then a response. So this might sound intense, but I want to ask you, what excuse is good enough to say to God, not yet? Is there anything? Because again, our Lord knows. He knows if he's going to call us to something, and as we're giving our life for him, he knows where we're at. He's full of patience and grace and mercy for us. So for us to turn around and say, no, 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 not yet, God. What a crazy thought. I think that's why Jesus is so blunt. He kind of cuts through the excuse. And we'll kind of waves all that away and says, I've called you to follow me, and I know what I'm doing with my timing. And so who am I to say, no, you just need to wait a little bit, Jesus. I don't feel ready yet for that. But in my life with him, things keep coming up, and I find myself trying to give excuses to God. I just don't think, I don't think I'm ready. When I was younger, and I said that I Grew up in a Christian home. I'm so grateful for that. My mom did pass away when I was young. She died of cancer when I was 12. And the Lord used that, worked through that hard time in my life to actually give me a real heart to want to um, be a youth pastor and to, to minister to other young people going through our time. But when I got into high school, we had moved to a new location. And I really struggled. I really struggled to live my life for God. And I justified it in my mind. I said, you know, when I go off to college, that's when I'll get serious with that. And I went through that at that age, and maybe some of you can relate to that, but things that I go through in my adult life, 
or when God puts it on my heart to do something, and I just excuse it away. Eh, God, you know, in a couple weeks, I'll be in a better spot. I'll have more room in my schedule in a couple weeks. Or, Lord, give me uh, a heart to talk to this person. Well, you know, what I know that they're dealing with, you know, let me, God, I think it would be better, like, next Tuesday to do that. What a crazy thing that I would say to Jesus, an excuse. And that's what Jesus dealt with this guy. He knows. He just got very blunt. says, you know, when I call you to follow me, not only am I doing the right direction for you, but I know the timing. I know what's going on. So let all those excuses just fall to the ground, and you follow me. Now Jesus talks to the third man. And says, yet another said to him, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to my family. Again, that doesn't sound like a bad excuse, does it? But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. <laughs> so this actually, I believe, is the biggest control issue of them all, and it's relationships. And there's other parts in Scripture where Jesus talks about relationships and you, you got to know, it's not that he's against our families, because Jesus created that. But God also wants you and I to be very clear. What's the most important thing in our life? Following Jesus. Yeah. And if this relationship gets in the way of that, what's going on there? So you've got the control issue about direction and timing. But the control issue with relationships is that's, that's what I see that most often People step out of there following Jesus because it gets too hard. They got friends that are against them. Their family doesn't want them to be so religious. <laughs> Maybe someone they have a relationship with is not following God. Uh, I tell you, one of my instances in life, I'm not proud about this, but I try to be very transparent about it. So I was very um, shy and not shy. What's what? Is there any good word for nerdy and dorky? <laughs> If any word sounds better than that, please have your, that in your mind. So at least there's some dignity. I was just nerdy. And, um, and even at coming to the end of high school, uh, we did move around quite a bit. So I was in a new high school for my junior and senior year. I was just tired of trying to get to know new people. So every day I just read a book. Just read a book in my classes. During lunchtime, I went sat in the library, read a book. and Just didn't talk to other humans. I just read my book. Now, in one of my classes, there happened to be the head cheerleader of the school who thought that was so funny that she actually started talking to me. They came around to prom, and she asked me to go to prom. It was just crazy. It's like some movie or something. And so, you know, this, this young lady, so we went on some dates. I didn't know if she was a believer or not. She wasn't. And then through the summertime after I graduated, boy, I really started developing feelings for her. And we're going through my summer, and you know, I had been very clear. God had, had, was leading me to go into ministry, even to youth stuff. I knew the school I was going to go to. Well, until that summer, when this pretty girl liked me, <laughs> and I started having feelings. And I started talking about, you know, maybe, maybe I don't need to go to that college, you know. Maybe I can do this a different way. Why can't I just stay here? I'll go to college for this other thing. And then I could add in, you know, so, and I tell you, it, it came right down to the wire that really un, unintentionally developing feelings for someone, that relationship almost steered me away from what I knew God was calling me to do. And all of us know, we've seen it in God's people just over and over. Somebody, they develop feelings for someone that's not following Jesus, and it just steers them away, Right? We see that. So how is Jesus dealing with this topic? There's nothing wrong with relationship. There's nothing wrong with family. But he's saying, listen, don't let anything stop you from following me. So what if your friends and family aren't happy with the level of involvement you have with church? Gosh, when I also was a teenager, I had two buddies, and they invited me to go out to there. We lived in Wisconsin. So way out in the country, out in the forest of trees, they call it the woods. Hey, let's go out in the woods. We're going to set up a tent and go camping. 
So my buddies, the first time I was about to go do that, they told me the reason they were doing that. Because my older brother got all this beer, and so we can go out for the weekend and get drunk and stay there and nobody will know. So made an excuse first time, didn't go, didn't go. Finally, they really pressed me on it because we were friends. And with my little bit of understanding I knew, I told them, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and I know that's not what God wants for me in my life, and I don't want to do that. Well, that was the end. That was the end of those relationships. Those guys, it just kills me, were so mean to me for the next two years, mocking me. You know, it's just crazy that I had a great friendship with them, and now they're yelling at me in the halls and calling me choir boy and mocking and laughing. And just because of a little thing, but oh, did I feel the pressure. I want to still be friends. Those relationships were huge in my life. And as Jesus talks to this man, he tells him, okay, friendships, relationships, even family. There's nothing wrong with that. But, again, are you trying to control that? Or are you willing to say, God, I'm just following you? Not, not trying to set all this up so everyone's happy and keep all, God, I just got to follow you. It reminds me when I drive, um, I don't know if I, I used to think I looked young. And now I think I look old. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, people that know me say I look older. People, th I don't know. But I tell you, I am old because I can't stand driving in my car. Or maybe this is just a old guy thing. I hate GPS. I just can't stand it. That voice telling me. <laughs> maybe it's because you know I used to in the day, so I print out directions. I see the directions. So now when I'm driving, I got. My directions, I got the voice trying to tell me, and then, to be honest, I got my co-driver <laughs> telling me also, no, no, go there, go there. Got a lot of voices. You can't do it. you got to follow one thing, right? You guys know how that is. If you listen to all those different voices, I don't know where you end up. You have to pick one. In Jesus' day, he used the example from his culture of plowing. And when someone would hold on to that plow, whether they had an uh, animal up front pulling it, or actually most often it was another person at this time of day. So you had one guy up there, a strong guy hopefully pulling, but then you had the one back holding onto the plow. And you know how they made a straight row that would work good for their farms? Is they looked ahead, they, they looked at a point, maybe a tree across the way, and they aimed for that. So Jesus is saying, can you imagine trying to drive like that? and you're looking over your shoulder, your line is not going to be straight. Your plow, there's no way. It's going to make a funny, it's going to go in wrong places. So Jesus says that in our world. I think of the voices on the GPS for me, but it's the same issue. Who, who really is the one that I'm listening to? Who's the one that I'm paying attention to to take my direction that way? So Jesus brings up all three of these, right? And again, I want you to think of that illustration I told you that I saw in the cartoon of driving a car. If this car is your life, what stops me from following Jesus is, i got to grab that wheel. I want to drive. I want to go where I think, right? I want to go the certain times I want to go. I'm listening to maybe somebody and paying attention to that. All of that as opposed to saying, no, Jesus, you're directing my life. You're the one that's going to send me and take my life to where you want it to be. You know exactly the place I'm at, so you have the right timing for everything. And Jesus, any other voice, I'm not going to listen to. You're the one calling the shots. So this section of scripture and those issues, there we have it. That's, I'll be really honest, in all my years now in church stuff, that's why Jesus' followers quit for these things. And he told us all that time ago, praise God. But I want to ask you to think of that too. Because I really don't think these issues, because they're so fundamental, I don't think that you only deal with them once in life. Because it's control, right? I heard, I came across a theologian once and I know your pastor loves 
I'm, I'm just so thankful that you get fed such a wonderful, high-protein diet of good, solid Bible and theology. So let me um, kind of reverse engineer some of that good food for a second. Say this. I ran across someone, a scholar, that said, here is the foundation, the basic thing about all theology. Here it is. God is God, and we're not, and we're not okay with that. That really is a fundamental thing in my and your relationship with God. We constantly grapple with that. God is God, and I'm not. And I'm not okay with that. I am constantly trying to take things back over. So my Jesus that loves me, that loves you, talks about these things, lays them out, continues to call us to have this open heart, to keep saying, God, I'm having trouble with this direction. God, I'm having trouble following your timing. God, I'm having trouble with my relationships and keeping you as the main voice. I constantly work on that. But I want to encourage you that even in these last days, we identify that and we come before the Lord with it and he keeps working with us. If I know what's coming up in the road, <coughs> I can deal with it, right? So can I ask this morning if you would just close your eyes. Sometimes in church together, we have times where we respond to things. It's not because there's some uh, pastor scorecard that they have to have you check off. It's just because, you know, it's good for me to kind of roll over what I just heard and then actually respond to it. So I'm going to ask with everyone's eyes closed, I'd like to pray about these things, each, each one of these three control issues. And if you identify that that's something that you've been wrestling with, then this morning is the time to, to respond to that, to really confess that before the Lord, ask Him to forgive us, and we get it cleaned up. Don't let these issues grow until it knocks you off track. So with your eyes closed and no one really looking around, it's between us and the Lord. But can I ask if the issue of your direction and where you want your life to head, if you feel like you're trying to control that, you need to let it go to Jesus, if you can just raise your hand and we'll pray about that together. Amen. Lord God, you see our hands. You know, Lord, even when we try to say, God, you're, you're in control and I give my life to you, we get scared, God. We try to take back where it's going. We try to grab on again to say, this is where I want my life to end up. But Lord Jesus, today we confess that, Lord, and we say, God, you are in charge. Lord, thank you that you love us and will give us a fulfilling life and we give our life into your hands. Use us as you will, Lord, to shed your light to this dark world. And so, God, Help us to be open with our hands to say, Lord, you set our direction. We give that to you. And now some of us can I ask if you have an issue or have a hard time to identify something lately in your life about the timing. Where God has brought up something and it's just such a struggle and you don't want to do that now or you're trying to put that off. But you know that God is calling you to this. You go ahead also and raise your hand and I'll pray. I'll identify that with us. Yes, Lord God, you know, you know that in our hearts when you speak to us, sometimes we just give excuses, Lord. We just put that out there. So God, we confess those things, Lord, we pray that you would fill in our hearts with us. We, Lord, even though we never look the other way, a lot of ways, God, we would trust you to And for those of us that raise our hands, Lord, we do say, God, you speak to us and we will listen. And we won't give excuses, God. Together for that, we want to follow as you speak to us. And the last thing, the idea of friendships or relationships that get in the way and try to speak to us that kind of get us off track. You go ahead to raise your hand if you feel like that's something in your life. Lord, you see that too. We know we love family and friends, and God, it's not that's not a bad thing. But Lord Jesus, I let that speak to how I'm living my life. And I let that become a stronger voice than yours. God, 
we ask for forgiveness for that. And Lord, help us to be still clear on what you're saying and be still clear on how you're leading us, Lord, that we can be able to listen to that one voice in our mind. God, you know our lives. You know these things. God, you're not going to put us in a bad position. And so with these friendships and family and relationships, thank you, Lord God, that you are the most important relationship we have. Go that life of us, we pray. So Jesus, thank you for sticking out. God, thank you as you met with and talked with these three followers that, that we can see that we can learn from that, Lord. And continue to help us with our following after you. Just thank you that you love us so much. Even in these hard last days, even in God, with these issues that I deal with as kind of an insider, you know, strengthen my walk with you as I follow you. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.